And this week, we have a very special guest. We're so excited to have our third part of our interview with Donald P. Borchers, the producer of Vamp, Tough Turf, Crimes of Passion, Children of the Corn, and Angel, all for New World Pictures. I'm Ryan. With me, as always, is Mark. I wish that Teen Vamp was part of the vampisphere. The, the vamp, <laughs> I mean, the, isn't it? <laughs> isn't the vampiverse. It? The vampiverse. That's what I was looking right. for. Right. Uh, I, I hemisphere the universe. VCU. I the, yes. the, the vamp connected universe. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> if just if just a little bit, if just Grace Jones had shown up just once, we it could have right. would have felt it like okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. If that Patricia Morrison had you know <laughs> had some connection <laughs> to Grace Jones, that would be amazing. Right. If she had been in a James Bond movie, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, Erica. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, I'm here too, guys. I'm here. I'm also part of the VCU. Just uh, fan. Just also, you know, happened to be here for this podcast. There you go. Hey, guys. Oh, hey. Yeah. You probably didn't uh, probably didn't notice I was even here because I've been practicing my vampire skills of um, unnoticeability. So I yeah, think it's working. Yeah, <laughs> disappearing. I think it's working. <laughs> As Teen Vamp has, they can also just teleport yeah. away. Yeah. Who uh, knew? Or be invisible. It's hard to say. And exactly. And be out I in the know. day. The daylight. Daylight doesn't <laughs> yeah. affect them. Different rules. Mm -hmm. Different still rules go to high school. For different vamps. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we, now, we are going to talk to Donald Borchers, and we're going to talk to him about vamp, but we're also going to talk to him about a bunch of other things. Children of the Corn, Tough Turf, and a couple other projects that Donald was working on at the time, including his unmade film, 357 Vigilante, and Crazy from the Heat, a film based on David Lee Roth's EP of the same name. Oh. We'll talk a little bit about that. We also talk about how Nine and a Half Weeks was a nearly New World film. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. And uh, we will also delve into some of the issues that Borchers experienced working at New World and uh, his contentious relationship he had with um, Bob Remy. Enough from us. Let's get into our conversation with Donald P. Borchers. Um, there's some time between uh, Tough Turf and Vamp. Um, I guess just in terms of when they each shot. But did you, were yeah, you, you basically would call, you going would call, for... You no, know, you would call that 357 Vigilante. Um, okay. Yes, I actually had a, a, an action script written by fucking Michael Blake and Richard Wank. Yes, sir, I did. And yes, I had Kevin Costner attached to star in it. Wow. Wow. What what happened? Yeah. Bob Ramey killed the deal. I think I think it was out of spite, to tell you the truth, because of the way I treated him on both Tough Turf and, and Bam. Like he excuse me, crimes of passion. He was really pissed that Tony Perkins was a priest. He was really pissed about these things. So now he's pissed about all that from Daily. So now imagine it's the sneak preview in Vegas for Children of the Corn. And I'm sitting next to the head of distribution, Elliot Slutsky, and everybody knows that Bob saw the rough cut, which I told him not to watch because it wasn't scored. I said, we're not a real studio, Bob. I don't have any money to give you temp music and temp effects. You watch a naked film, it's not going to fucking play. It's naked. You need the music to make this work. Right. The suspense, suspense music is what makes it fucking suspenseful. God, other than that, every movie is just a guy walking around. You know, it's walking around with the suspense music that makes you think what's around the next corner. It's not him walking around. Take take all the sound off. It's not scary. And and Bob doesn't get that. And right. so he's watching the movie and he's giving me all these fucking editing notes. And I'm acting like I'm writing them down. And I know he's not. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm turning pages and scribbling and drawing and scribbling and drawing and not, not making words or anything. Right. And turning another page and being very rapid and acting like I'm I'm care. And, um, and so now we're in Vegas at the Red Rock and, uh, and good for me that Harry Sloan and, and, um, John Feltheimer are, are fucking addicted to the crap table. Who knew, who knew they were <laughs> maniacs? I'm, I'm sure they're well over it now being billionaires at one point. You have to, I mean, what, what are you playing for this? If you're a right. billionaire, what's this kind of money to you? Uh, you have a different gambling you evolve into, but, uh, and they did, and they did well. But at the time, uh, they had just won. Good for me. So we're all going over to the Red Rock Theater in a good mood. <laughs> and, and so this is fabulous. Now the movie, um, and the kid sits up, and Linda Hamilton screams, and everybody screams. And I'm sitting next to Elliot Slesky, who's our domestic distributor. And he screams. 
and, and, and he screams out of such frightfulness that his hand ends up um, flailing against me, <laughs> like in, in shock and terror. Yeah. And, 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 and he goes, um, you got to hit Borchers. We're 10 minutes into the movie. He says, you scream like that once in a movie and you have a hit and you're already 10 minutes in and you already have it. He says, you, you won, you won. So um, now, now it, it's, it, it's afterwards and everybody's come up to me and asked me which, which changes were Bob's. And I tell them the whole story about all I did was score it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, I, 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 I didn't have the money to make the changes. I didn't have the time. I have one of the greatest editors that the world, this is one of the greatest contributions that my producing partner, Terry Kirby made. He got Harry Karamidis as our editor. Look yeah. up Harry's credits. Oh yeah, Harry's no, he, yeah. Well, Tons Harry had no, no business working on this movie. None. Right. No business whatsoever. And so, so um, uh, like, like when Fritz said he wanted to do pickup shots, um, I said to Harry, do we need them? And Harry said, well, we need these. <laughs> so we shot, we shot those. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, you know, and, 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 and when, when I gave him all of Bob's notes, he said, yeah, you just need to score it. <laughs> and, and I said, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I mean, I told him the ones that I remembered and for what, what it's worth. Right, so, right. So, so now Ramey comes out and now mind you, everybody, but everybody, but everybody is there and knows the gag that he's ordered all these cuts and I haven't made them. And Harry Sloan in particular has always been amused by me. And that he gave me all my chances and I paid off for him every time. And so now he watches Bob take credit for everything. Did I mention that to you about his characteristics? Yes. <laughs> he, how he had saved the picture and, and how I had dutifully made each and every one of my cuts. And everybody knows mm. this right. every, I mean, every, So Harry's cracking up and Elliot's cracking up. I start to crack up, Roger cracks up and, and Bob doesn't get the joke and, and nobody's gonna tell him. <laughs> you know? Same thing happened on Tough Turf, right? So. Um, I'm just about to start photography on Tough Turf, and I've gotten everything, my choices. I've got to make my fucking movie. And, and, and now Bob calls me in, and he's thinking that he might have to cancel the picture. And, and I sit next to him, and I cancel the picture. What are you, crazy? Everything's working. Every, the kids are crying for a movie like this. I said, this will be tantamount to what Arkoff used to do with beach blanket movies. We're gonna have a movies for kids with kids and it delivers and everything. And there's music and, and action and love story. This is a movie, baby. And he <laughs> said, yeah, but, but, but Streets of Fire didn't open. I said, I, wa I want to see Streets of Fire. I, I, I said, first of all, they lost Bruce Springsteen for a reason. He read the fucking script. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, second of all, no, no, my, I'm in the room with Bob Ramey, president of the company, Roger Burlidge, chief financial officer. Oh, excuse me. Bob Ramey, chairman of the company, Roger Burlidge at the time, president of the company, um, Peter Beerstead, head of legal, vice executive vice president, Paul Allman, head of production, and, and, and Jeff Sheckman, vice president of production. I mean, this is it. This is the brass. The buck stops here. That's it. And so I'm saying these things to Bob. Right. And, and I'm seated next to him. And the other three people are kind of like on diminutive couches that minions would sit on, you know, the, and it's intentional furnishing. You know, the king sure. has his. And, and so I'm sitting next to the king on the small chair and everybody else is in the court. And, um, and, 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 and I said, I don't know what bozo would green light a love story that has no fucking scenes between the two leads. I said, watch Streets of Fire. He finds out a girl he used to know is in trouble. Then he goes to find her. They have no scenes together, Bob. Now I'm exaggerating. A little. Count right. them. It's like three. It's like yeah. three. There's no, I said, Bob, just think about drama for a second. There's no possible way to build an arc if there's never interaction because characters divine through action. I said, they're selling this like a love story. They're selling it the wrong way. Streets of Fire can work as a movie, but it's it's not a love story, right? And 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 I'm and, and you know and Tough Turf wanted to be sold the way they actually sold Streets of Fire, so Bob wasn't wrong calling calling it, but I wasn't wrong either. They didn't deliver what they promised. They said we're going to actually deliver what we promised, mm -hmm. and so that Bob looks at me, and and if you can have an image of a person who's 
dutifully straightening your suit jacket and with his pinky finger wiping the lint from it says to me i <laughs> i am the bozo that greenlit that movie <laughs> <laughs> at this point at this point roger burlidge who doesn't track such things right. can't hold it in and he literally has fallen off the couch convulsing in laughter Wow. It's that funny. I mean, it's it's literally sitcom <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's I the am, am, perfect timing, just the excellent setup. Yeah. And so I said the same thing I said to him that I said to David Madden on my Children of the Corn sequel for the exact same reason when they said stupid things about shutting down production to me days before filming. I said, if you want to explain to your shareholders why you're, you know, three quarters of a million dollars spent and to do a $2 million spend and you want to write it off and I've seen your balance sheet, go for it. I said, I have a profitable movie here. There is no reason to stop it. What, what, the discussion we're having is an unreasonable discussion. Mm. You're, compare, you're comparing me to a fanciful, high-end, art-directed action picture with great music and great action sequences being missold as a love story to a movie that's a, sto that's a, a drama about a downwardly mobile boy whose only ray of light is a girl he can't have. There's no comparison between the two things. I have a modicum of action in mind because you need to have some action in a movie like this. But right. you're not giving me any money to deliver an action movie. You want me to rewrite it as an action movie? I can do that, but you know, that's not what you, this movie is ready to go, baby. And, and, and so then I marched right out of there into the owners, because that's the difference when you're at New World. There's not only a president and a chairman, there's an owner. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I made the same argument in a completely coherent and rational way to Harry Sloan without an appointment. I got walk-in privileges because I made Angel and I made Corn and I didn't abuse them. And I never think I walked in before. And I said, the stupidest thing just happened in the room next door. And you need to do something about this or explain this to your shareholders. That, that's a really good way to talk to owners, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, sure. Bring out the bottom line. Uh, tell them, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, I, they're I, accountable I, at that point. In particular, yeah, New see, World at that point was, was accountable because they had gotten in with Falcor Investment Group and had a whole bunch of investors that they had to appease. This was the Rothschild offering at the time. I, mm. it, that's how I, that's how I beat Joe. What's his name over at Screen Media when he was stealing me blind on distributing my foreign rights to movies like Desire and Hell. I mean, I'm getting a just uh, I'm getting a statement from ASCAP paying me two thousand dollars for airing the show on television in France. I'm getting a statement from Screen Media saying it's not sold in France. To get two thousand dollars, you had to have a hundred thousand dollar sale in France. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's saying it wasn't sold at all. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, so um, I, I write him a, a letter and I copy all of his board members. He's incensed that I have gone over his head to his board members. Uh, we got a um, binding arbitration 10 days later and I won. And, and so when you go to Harry, you kind of talk to him about it. Clearly, the, the movie goes forward because, you know. It, it, there is no decision at New World that either wasn't actively or passively approved by Harry Sloan, period. Harry was, was it. Ha mm. Harry, that's it. Larry Cuffin had the pleasure in life of hitching his wagon to, to Larry, Harry Sloan at a law firm at a point in time where the yin and the yang was making money. Harry's yin was his outwardly charming personality and ability to invite and attract talent of every caliber. Managers, agents, attorneys, actors, writers, producers, directors. The same trick we were talking about, Crimes of Passion, that wasn't the only picture that was doing it. Another one that was happening was Harry Sloan brought Ron Howard in with Rainbow Warrior. And I did the budget for Ron. I mean, and this was such a green light picture. Ron was taking Spanish Berlitz courses. He was ready to shoot this in six weeks. They were never going to make that movie. They yeah. just walked around town telling everybody we're doing Ron Howard's next picture while they were casting Transylvania 6, 5,000 and other things. Got it. Wow. This is, uh, you know, this is why we're so fascinated by New World Pictures. It's such an interesting <laughs> place. And, and one of my questions for you was going to be after Angel and, and Children of the Corn, I just felt like, 
uh, you probably had carte blanche, and it doesn't sound like you really did because what you're saying oh, no. in between it, everything got worse. Exam, it, no, it, everything it, got worse. I, I wanted to do 357 vigilante. That picture should have been made. It would have been just as good as Death Wish or or. or the script wasn't as good as Dirty Harry, but it deli it hit the genre just as hard. Um, it, it it could be made today and still work. You know the way that Avi Nesher makes, uh, I guess you know, Avi Lerner makes all those movies. Mm -hmm. um, but 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 um, Bob Ramey just wanted to hurt me. He just wanted to to send me a message that if I was really hiding things on Crimes of Passion and then this in, in my mistake, I had not built up my spend enough fast enough which I learned on Children of the Corn. I, I learned that when you're making movies like that, prepay fucking everything, set up uh, escrow accounts, make it be that they got to really pay money if they crash the picture. So I was only about $20,000, $25,000 spent. I had, my idea for the helicopter was it was going to be anthropomorphic. It was going to look like a giant insect. And I had this whole cockroach theme with criminals equated with cockroaches. And so the air traffic reporter was going to fly in it helicopter that looked like a cockroach and instead of renting a helicopter where Vic Morrow got killed with the helicopter I was never going to actually rent a helicopter I was going to use a crane and then just pick up this piece that looked like the front of a helicopter okay. and I was going to use trick photography to cut the blades in and everything with angled shots and, and storyboards and, and it would have been very believable and it would have been fabulous and so um, I had to pay off the carpenter who had built everything you know it was twenty thousand dollars into the guy that I that was going to be the longest build, so I ordered that first um, to have everything ready for the show. <laughs> and, and Bob just caught, just he just cut me down. Can you imagine Kevin Costner starring in a movie? And he's saying to me that Kevin Costner isn't a star. And the next year, he's financing the movie directed by Tony Scott starring Kevin Costner. Uh, Revenge, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I mean, for fuck's and, sake. And and didn't also New World also release Gunrunner, which also starred Kevin Costner as well. So yes, it's odd I, that he I, suddenly did. I saw I saw Parachute School, I knew JJ Harris, and I got it on one. And and I also had the inside information because when we were casting Crimes of Passion, we learned an awful lot inadvertently about the production of uh, The Big Chill. Uh, because Kevin Costner was a, a big consideration for crimes. Um, on our part, mm. not on his, not on his part, on our okay, part. Okay, I see. I, I, yeah, we did a lot of research before we reached out to him, and after we reached out to him, it wasn't really ever going to happen. I, I, I can't remember if it was the studio or him or his agent, but it was a waste of time considering him. But through all of that, I learned all about how he was actually photographed and died and mm -hmm. seen, and I didn't know any of that stuff, and, and I learned mm. all of that stuff. And, and um, forget why I'm telling you this. Uh, because of 357 Vigilante uh, and him. Oh, yeah. So Kevin Costa was a slam dunk for me. He could he could nail it. We could cast around him with some other thing. I mean, this was as sure a New World Pictures there's ever been a New World Picture. But It sounds like the, it. Yeah, but the, the way that um, I embarrassed Bob on Children of the Corn, and he found out ultimately, and I embarrassed him on uh, Tough Turf, and he had to get spanked by Harry Sloan and the movie got made anyway, and he tried to kill it. He very successfully killed this as my next offering. In fact, the only reason Vamp got made was because um, there was a Canadian guy who had made three or four movies in a row up in Canada, and Nick, Nick, um, somebody, and uh, SC Entertainment, and and he said that he had the tax game down and he could put the money together to come up with the mo money for Vamp. So they gave okay. me Clay Boards, who had just done Alligator Shoes. Um, and, and I thought it was an interesting movie. And I gave him the old test on how producible he is. And he was really producible. He wasn't going to be any kind of problem. So I was sure that, that with Richard Wank, who I wanted to direct the movie, I was sure if I had him on the set as a writer, looking over Clay's shoulder, that we could get our movie made up there in Canada, so long as Richard didn't mind Clay getting credit for directing it. There was no doubt in my mind. So we go up there, we start to cast, and, and I make a list of all the things they got to start building if they're going to be ready for the show and nothing's going to be built. And I'm like, do you have any money? I mean, I know you have money to buy this hotel room for me and feed me, but there's no carpenters working. And, uh, and I reported all this to New World Management, and two days later, we were on a plane and came home. But the foreign guys 
uh, were all excited about the fact that um, I convinced Grace Jones to do the movie. And the okay. same way that the same way that Corn played out in between Firestarter and um, Cujo, we were in between her only two credits. We, fucking um, James Bond and Conan. These are twenty million dollar movies. Right. So, so, so how could you possibly get Grace Jones? Well, information is everything to an independent producer. And I got information that Grace couldn't pay her IRS bill. And, <laughs> and, and I got information that um, I, I, at this point in life, I'd have to check my notes. I, I have it in my head that we paid her two or three or four hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Pick a, pick a number, call it 350. <laughs> what, what, whatever that number was, it, it was not out of thin air. It was what she owed the IRS. So I call up her manager, Bob Caviano, and I say, I can, I can get this problem you have taken care of if she'll do this movie. It's, you know, two weeks prep with Greg Canham. He won the Academy Award for Cocoon and, um, and, then, and then six weeks shoot and, or five weeks, whatever it was. And yeah, I can't believe we shoot six weeks. So Bob says it's a great idea, but, you know, Grace, she's got her head in these $20 million movies now. It's going to be hard to convince her. I said, I got an idea. I, I met Anne Rice um, when I was doing Far From Home. I wanted Drew Barrymore to have a summer book, the way that girls, you know, read a book during the summer, at least when I was growing up. I wanted her to have a summer book, and I particularly wanted the book to be Belinda because I thought Drew was that kind of girl. <laughs> I thought she could be <laughs> fucking Belinda. <clears throat> and it was my way to make a backdoor entry to produce Belinda starring Drew Barrymore when she was 16 years old. So I became friends with Anne, and I couldn't get anybody interested in Belinda. And um, I learned a lot about adult filmmaking in Hollywood, and, and um, I, I, I easily pro prognosticated the failure that showgirls would have at the theatrical box office for all the reasons I learned on Crimes of Passion and, and my foray with Belinda. So, so she sends me Belinda, so I send her a copy of Crimes of Passion, and she loves it. And so she sends me a galley of, of her new script, which is, um, uh, oh, what's the name of it? Um, it's the S&M story where the guy uh, goes to the island. Um, they, they actually made it a, a really stinky version of it with Rosie O'Donnell as a comedy. Oh, which, which is yes, of, yes, 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 yes. Which is, which is kind of stupid because it's a fucking S&M book. Right. And, and, it, and anyway, she sends it to me. And, and I remember I was like embarrassed. I'm like, Anne, I, I went to Notre Dame. I'm a Catholic boy. I, I don't think I can read your books anymore. Stop this. <laughs> it was an ex Exit to Eden, I think was the. Was That's the... it. Exit to Eden. She sends me Exit to Eden. And I'm one of the first people to read it. I thought it was fabulous. God, did I want to make that in a movie. And when I saw the movie, I couldn't have been more depressed. <laughs> I, I felt like I was the writer who was raped, you know. Oh. Uh, because Exit to Eden is such a brilliant fucking book. Gary Marshall had a take and he just needed to clear rights. He wasn't trying to shoot the book. He was trying to sure. shoot a take on, on something right. that was right. the credit should have been loosely inspired by. Right, right. So getting grace uh, is how you, how you get, oh, basically oh, so, get Vamp made. So, 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 so I know how good Vamp is as a script, which is a solid winner at the box office, but not going to be press the tux for the Academy Awards, even anywhere near the radar. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I know the crimes of passion, you know, might maybe, but, you know, and I'm, I don't see myself making Academy nominated scripts at this point in time. And I'm thinking, so how am I going to get Grace Jones? Well, I had Greg Canham already. I filled out the rest of my, um, my department heads. I made sure to get a Westmore to run the makeup department. I got Academy Award winner Greg Canham on special uh, special effects makeup. I, I hired Dob Dar fucking Robinson to do stunts. You get mm. the idea. Oh yeah, I, I, top of um, yeah, I got, top the top of the line there. I, I brought Betty Madden from from Beastmaster over to do wardrobe. Um, and, and so I have all these great department heads. So I, I write Grace a personal letter, handwritten saying, Grace, I want you to do my show. I think you'd be a fabulous vampire. I don't think anybody would be a better vampire than you. My good friend, Anne Rice, wrote this fabulous book called Interview with a Vampire. Here's a copy, not of my script, of Anne Rice's book. <laughs> <laughs> and, here's, and, and here's all the people that are going to be working on now. Please do my movie. I never sent her the script. <laughs> I sent her Anne Rice's book, Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> A dozen roses in a way to get out of her tax problem. 
and I got and I got a yes. And then to wow. cinch the deal, Grace wanted to complete the negotiations in Los Angeles in person. And I'm thinking this woman's going to eat me up and chew me out. Now, at the time, I was fortunate enough to have enough money to pay for the legal services, which I had to end up doing my own legal on low budget movies. But at, at this point in time, I could afford an attorney. And because um, I had a three and a half million dollar budget. Vamp, I had like a six hundred thousand dollar budget. Excuse me, Voodoo, I had like a six hundred thousand dollar budget. You see the difference? Mm, you got yeah, right. you got to cut cut things out, like casting directors and eight, and attorneys. So Linda Lifter's doing doing my legal, and at the time she's breastfeeding, and literally the strategy was we bring the meeting into Linda's office, and during the meeting Linda's going to breastfeed in front of Grace. <laughs> Boy, did that soften Grace up. Mm. Everything we needed to close, close, and we got the signature in the room. And, and and getting her is what basically keeps anyone from messing with Vamp going forward, correct? Not really. Um, Vamp got into a position where um, when we were up in Canada and had her, the foreign guys started to sell the movie. Now, Richard Wank and I didn't want Grace to start. We wanted Jerry Lewis to play, be the barman. And we got it. He read the script and he said yes. And, and the foreign sales guy said it'll only work in France. And, and we said, we don't believe that. We believe he just needs the right movie. Yeah, I mean, people were, I had a, a John Travolta movie um, that I wanted to set up um, in uh, 90, the year before Pulp Fiction. And, and everybody kept saying, he's not a movie star. I said, he just needs the right movie. Hmm, yeah. No, his career is over. No, you guys got it wrong. You, you, you know, and, and so I was in the same position here. We wanted Jerry Lewis. We ended up with Grace Jones. We ended up then on their um, sales chart and they wanted the picture. They had it booked for release and everything. And, and then we just had to make dates, which was God awful. We had to shoot through the worst rains in January that they had had in decades. And, um, and the day the Challenger crashed, uh, I was downtown shooting vamp on a permit uh, where I had to hire two police officers on every intersection that's so that's eight eight cops in in, in, a, in an intersection so that i could do the, the the gag where the car spins 360 degrees well um daryl gates is trying to get to work the challenger has crashed nobody's in a good mood and we have gridlocked downtown los angeles with our stunt so daryl gates gets out of his car walks up to our set and revokes our, our permit i said you can't do that we have a permit do we good walk Los Angeles? You do that. I said, no, excuse me, sir. The people that you assigned to us gridlock Los Angeles, all we did was pay these cops. They said yes, they said no, they said good, they said go. No. We we said yes and and followed their instructions. We never asked them to make decisions to gridlock the city. That's on you. And if you want to shut us down, I could use the money. <laughs> we didn't we we didn't get shut down. And we made our day. Yeah, it's you guys almost got no time to edit that movie too, right? Like you, 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 we had plenty of time to edit that movie. Oh, really? Yeah. To, to edit Vamp? Yeah, there were, we we shot it in January and released it in July. We we edited February, March, April, May, June. The twenty weeks. Okay, I remember. But, well, there was like an outtake of. Um, uh Chris oh, okay. made piece what? and he was he was trying to vie for more editing time um for well Richard Wang, let me but... say and i don't know why that would be necessary um we didn't need it we had more than what we needed what, okay. what happened with vamp editing wise was um during photography i took a camera and the lead actors and started to shoot some second units off of the first unit where I didn't even need a call sheet. I was like, I have a script. We need a shot where you two are running across a roof. He's shooting tow trucks running right now. You're here. I'm going to grab a 2C and the second assistant camera and then take you guys up to the roof and shoot the shot. And um, the sequence involved running across a roof and then jumping into one of those construction debris things where you go down and shoot the whole way and everything. And that sequence that I photographed um, got cut out of the movie. Mm. I, 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 uh, I didn't disagree with the decision when, when, I mean, I didn't say, no, you have to use it. And, and when an editor and a director both agree on something, unless I have a reason, I'm not going to just make an argument to make an argument. 
So, um, so they cut it out of the movie. I heard, but I haven't seen for myself that there was a running length issue on the television versions because all the nudity that got cut out oh, and, okay. that they, and that they reinserted the scene for TV. Yeah, that would make sense. There is yeah, a good deal but, of nudity in the film, but... Yeah, but that's the only... Um, oh, okay. I mean, I, I didn't participate in any of the TV versions. Um, okay. But our theatrical version went out the, the way we intended it to. I, I mean, is, I, I paid sixty-five thousand fucking dollars to put Volari over the end credits. That came out of my pocket. Oh, Studio really? wouldn't pay for it. Yeah. Um, Vamp was was partly funded with uh, with money, like I said, from Balcor Film Investors, which I mentioned earlier. And it's like December of '85. New World and World Vision, um, who put New World movies on television, they are basically in a in a lawsuit. Did that have any impact on Vamp, or did that have any Nothing. impact on like your relationship with New World, or, or or the company itself? No. What what mucked up my relationship with New World was um, they made a, a decision to bring in an executive named Stephen White, and he came from television. Now, if nobody's ever told this to you before, then please take note: TV executives are trained to kill everything on arrival, and here's the reason why: if anything existing survives. They will never possibly get credit for it because it predated them. You, you, you get it? Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, let's say it fails. They will be blamed because they came in and they made a decision to go forward with something that they couldn't even get credit for. So, yeah, they're going to get blamed. So a television executive necessarily has to put to death everything that predated them. Upon Steve White's arrival at New World, my life there ended hmm. necessarily he couldn't get credit for anything i did and he could get blamed for anything i did where what were you setting up at the time that he just killed at that time? i mean you had finished vamp already or well yeah i was i was heavily promoting hugo pool with robert downey jr and and senior directing and um i didn't have a formal claim on the rights but I was heavily promoting that. I was heavily promoting Belinda with, with Drew Barrymore attached, although she didn't know that I was, I just figured I could get her based on my relationship. I'd done three sure. movies with her. Okay. And uh, um, what else was I touting at the time? Well, I this still is... wanted to get 357 Vigilante made. Oh, yes. I, I almost forgot. I, I spent my last six months at New World um, repurposing David Lee Roth's uh, Crazy from the Heat. So he had it set up at CBS and the deal crashed. And it was inexplicable to me why it crashed. And I knew one of the writers from Saturday Night Live because Richard Wank had him work on a treatment for us way back in the day, Barry Blaustein with Judy Simon. Uh -huh. and, and so, and so I, I, I talked to Barry, he read Crazy from the Heat. He said, shoot it, this is a good script. There's no reason not to make this movie. So I called up um, David Lee Roth's management, uh, Pete, what's his name? Really easy to find. They, they have an office right above the whiskey back in the day on Sunset. I mean, super, you could walk in, you know, that mm. easy. Mm. And, and so I talked to Pete, what's his name? And I said, um, can I take a run at it? He said, what do you mean? I said, uh, how much money do you need and what do you want? He said, well, you know, CBS was nickel and diamond us six and a half. We told him we needed eight. I said, you want $8 million. What else do you want? We, we want final cut. Okay. David directs. Okay. What, you know, our decision's everything. Okay. Got it. Um, I, I then meet with Marjorie Lewis, who's working for David Geffen. And um, he, they were doing an interview with Vampire at the time. And, and I, I said, I've got this David Lee Roth, crazy from the heat. I can turn it around from CBS. This is what he wants. And this, and this is through Marjorie, what Geffen got back to me. We're in. He says, $8 million is what I would spend producing and selling his next album. If he could give me a feature film and the album for the same money, I don't care if it's a piece of shit, I'll make the money on the album. He says, and I don't think, I don't think David's going to want to embarrass himself. I don't think he's going to make something that's embarrassing. Mm hmm and so, so Gethin's in. So now I fly to Three River Stadium. I, I have a, 
a, a backstage party experience with Pete and David Lee Roth that is epic and legendary. And, and I tell him everything and, and breaking this great news. And, and David says, this is fucked. I said, what, David, I got you a yes on every one of your asks. You don't get better than that. He says, yes, you do. We didn't ask right. I said, well, you have final cut, total control. He says, yeah, but Geffen just said yes like that. He's making more money on this than I am. Something's wrong here. And the paranoia just started to just ooze. And then I thought to myself, what kind of life you want to live? I mean, do you really want to work with this guy who, if you give him everything he wants, becomes unhappy? And right. he's a 500 pound gorilla. So I, I walked uh, that night. I finished the party, got on the plane, went home, and that was the end of that. Except I ended up dating the receptionist for another month. <laughs> So speaking of projects that, that nearly got made at New World, um, was it true that New World had a chance at nine and a half weeks? Oh, yeah. That was um, at the same time I had MIA in. That was very early on, 83. That was uh, due to uh, Lawrence Myers. He's a very renowned foreign salesman, and he brought the, the, the project in. And he really, really, really believed in it, really advocated it. And that's where I met Zalman King for the first time. But again, yeah. on, the, on the lessons I was about to learn on crimes of passion, I was starting to learn at this time, it wasn't a good fit for our business plan. We didn't have the relationships with exhibitors that could embrace a sexual adult film. Our exhibitors had to account to PTAs. Simple okay. as that. Yeah, there's no way we could really monetize what that film did monetize for. Huh. It, it, our, square peg round hole day one so it's so interesting because i just i feel like if there is a new world movie particularly 83 i mean this feels like nine and a half weeks was kind of a slam dunk but that's interesting no you're not you're, you're, you're mixing up sex and violence john dillinger's a slam dunk <laughs> okay bonnie and clyde's a slam dunk gangster movies are a slam dunk angel sure. you know a uh, prostitute uh, with a serial killer is a slam dunk. Okay, mm. s and love story, tough fucking sell. Mm, okay, yeah. I mean, in Crimes Gary, of Passion was- Gary Marshall was... had to change it into a black comedy to get it produced. <laughs> right, right. That's true. N name, name three fabulous s and movies. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a, that's a challenge. I'll have to get back to you on tell that you one. Something. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. The world has evolved to the point where they're ready for it. With, with the way that the streamers are streaming, you go to Disney and you know what that is. You know to Peacock, you know what that is. Amazon surprises you with, with voyeurs, with um, um, Sydney uh, from Euphoria. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the only entries out there like that right now. And I think everybody is truly underestimating that genre. And I think that genre is going to open up theatrically. Hmm. Well, because you think about it, the streamers are going to get killed because... If they if they start to put like twenty voyeurs up there with Sydney, what's her name from Euphoria, um, the PTA is going to come after them and say, "Where are the parental blocks? My kids can access this." Right. Right now, it's below the radar because there's so little of it. See, the theaters could own that. Hmm. Right. Well, that's the only yeah the only place they could right. Yeah, and that's why I think they'll come back. And those are the best movies for dates too. Yeah. Um, so when you leave New World, like the relationships broken down, did you, what did you do right up? What was the first thing you did? Um, I know you- The first you, thing I did was field a phone call from a man named Don Levin, who financed Angel and got to know me so well on Angel that he would stay at my second bedroom when he was visiting in town. Um, and, and he financed the movie. I met him on an eye for an eye, which you might recall, I set that project up. Right. So here's Don Levin. He's made money with me on an eye for an eye. He's made money with me on Angel. I offer him Children of the Corn before Balcor's in on the deal because I'm trying to do my thing. And he says yes, but his producing partner, Mel Pearl, who just passed away last month, says no. And I don't know why, but he says no. And so uh, Don sees all the success we had with Corn, And then he hears about Steve White and my days at New World are done. And he calls me up from Chicago and says, Here's an airplane ticket. Come on out. And so I spend the weekend with him at his pad in Chicago. And he says that he'll pay for me to have an office on 
Hollywood and Vine and an assistant, and I can start to look for projects in a finance one. And we made Tumor Injunction. Right. And that's your first producing project. Then you, you directed after that. But are you, and you're making these- uh, What happened was I became friends with Paul Bartel and I got really jealous of his bank account after he made Eating Raul. And mm. I thought, well, you know, if I liquidate everything, I have enough money to make a half a million dollar picture. I'll pick a horror movie and do my own. And I only made one bad decision on that movie. Did it cost me? Yeah, I turned down grave, Barbara, grave secrets. Yeah, I turned down Barbara Javits cash off, offer from the home video company she was buying for at the time. And I went with a back end deal um, with Lenny Shapiro at Shapiro Glickenhaus. Right, if I took okay. the cash, I would have had an immediate profit. I went with Lenny and I lost everything. Huh. That's weird. I thought, I mean, I felt like uh, Shapiro Glickenhaus, I thought they had a pretty decent reputation for, for you know, picking stuff up, but um, that's, that, that's interesting. Um, did, within just within 18 to... months, Lenny didn't, within 18 months, Lenny didn't even work at his own company anymore. Oh. Everything was crashing. Okay. If you think, it, yeah, it's just so one it of those was just, things. Yeah, they were just sort of falling apart at the time. They were. And if they did what Barbara Javits was going to do, which was to piecemeal the rights off, but they tried to sell everything direct. Hmm. Like Barbara was just going to sell to Blockbuster, right? Right. Uh, they, they, they went wholesale direct to everybody. And, and they were falling so apart. I'm sure I got ripped out of some money too. Yeah. But that water under the bridge. Those are the old days. So that's what happened on, on oh. Grave Secrets. I wanted to direct it because I thought owning a picture would be my path forward. Sure. And, and I wasn't wrong. I just, I had the right distributor in my hand and I turned it down for a greater illusion of money. Hmm. I mean, you know, not, it makes sense. I mean, it's hard to fault that logic. I'm sure at the time too, considering you had mortgaged yeah. so much for it. The next two movies I directed, Perfect Fit and, and the remake of Corn, was, was just financial decisions. It was just, the budgets were so low. And no matter who you get into business with directing, they can cause budget increases. It's just a fact. I mean, it's just simple math. So um, I just chose to direct the two movies so that I could control the costs. No, no other reason. Mm. There wasn't any hidden agendas. Sure. And so around the time you're making Grave Secrets, New World is actually kind of go, getting out of the theatrical distribution business. Um, yeah, what, what happened was um, the, the heir of Revlon, what's his name? Um, bought, bought uh, what is his name, Ron Perlman. He, yeah. he, 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 he bought the majority interest in New World. He came from a cosmetics background and he had a real simple business plan. New World through their LF Rothschild uh, offering had bought an extraordinarily large number of independent television stations, making it the most wieldly independent TV aggregation at the time. They really spent their money well. They actually bought and sold Marvel. Yeah, yeah, um, they yeah. they they made some they, like Incredible Hulk movies and stuff. They made, mainly did stuff on television and had some projects that didn't go forward. But it's because they weren't worrying about running the companies. It was all merger acquisition shit, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so um, so because they had all these TV stations, uh, Perlman had this vision of of global networking, and and that was coincident to the point that Fox was trying to grow. So um, they did a merger agreement. In 1987, do I have it right? Either 87 or 97. Fuck it, a long time ago. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Fox merged with New World. It's not an acquisition, it's a, a merger. And Fox Television Network includes all of the New World owned and operated. In that transaction, there, there was two assets. The one asset was this group of TV stations, which I just talked about. The second a a asset was the New World Library itself. And that bifurcated. Mm -hmm. The rights bifurcated into US television on the one hand and everything else on the other hand. And everything else on the other hand got folded into a company that was first called Oceana Film Distributors run owned by Bob Bennett and Larry Cuffin and run by Bill Shields. And then it morphed itself into a second company called Lakeshore, 
which ultimately got bought out by that Chicago investor. Uh, and, I think and, it's and, RLJ Entertainment. Yeah, and then run by Gary Lucchese up until two years ago when, when Gary left the ship. And so that's where the New World Library resides today is at the current Lakeshore RLJ thing, unless it's US TV, in which case it's um, at Disney, which because they bought Fox. Right, um, right. And that's with the exception of those specific titles, Hellraiser, Corn, Crimes of Passion, Angel. There's about 20 of them that Larry Cuppen on his own through his company, Fifth Avenue Ta Entertainment, approximately 1992, acquired a finite list of titles for the purposes of remaking and such. Right. And he eventually does make them, but then he sold the rights. Like he made Children of the Corn 2, he made Hellraiser 3, but then he sells the rights over to Miramax Dimension and they no, held them. He sold, he sold the right to make sequels to the movie got to it, Miramax Dimension, which then Disney inherited. And then in, 19, in 2016, five, seven, six years ago, I purchased directly from Larry all of the rest of his rights. Huh. So you own all those movies then? I mean, you, have, you own the rights to your movies, essentially. Corn, took a, corn, just corn, corn. Corn, Oh, just corn. Okay, okay I see, I see. Um, so That's how come I could make a license to Lucas Foster three years ago. Right, right. And, and, uh, and potentially you could, you could make other corn movies, I guess, as long as it's well, not in the I have US. my eyes on a TV series. What I want right. to do is finish feeding my dead horse on my action comedy, Good Cop, Grand Pop, which is, um, surprisingly enough, got action comedy and breasts, and it's a PG-13. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's a movie that should be made. Joe Mignon likes it. Michael Lehman likes it. John Travolta likes it. Everybody who actually reads it actually likes it. The problem is this guy who's running Warner Brothers is, is bringing this new pc -dom into Hollywood. And I don't think my, my movie has as much chance as clearing the PC radar because of the way my jokes are told as a new Larry the Cable Guy movie would have. Mm. So I need to find a niche distributor to get this movie made. And I really want to finish taking a run at this before I, I undertake porn because I'm really no good trying to do two things at once. And so, so you're still trying to put projects together, which is which is awesome to hear. Um, well, I have th I have three films ready to go, but the problem is two of them are movies. You know about my good cop grand pop, and and I'm struggling with that because um, an irreverent action comedy isn't necessarily on anybody's radar as a want to be made yet. When you see other guys and due date drop on Netflix two years ago as ten year old movies, they drop in the top ten. That's right. how much. Yeah. That's yeah. how much demand and little supply there is for comedy action buddy movies. It's so genre. true. I, so true. My, my my vision with this script is to re reboot the Bob Hope and Crosby on the Road series. That's where I want to go with this. Mm. Nobody's doing that, and, mm -hmm. and there's a big hole in the people want that anyway. Yeah. The second no. one I have <clears> is <throat> finished and ready to go. It's the true story of um, the Carol Little fashion industry murders by the Armenian mafia in the early 90s, right after the Rodney King riots. It's a fabulous story and I've written it and it's perfect. It's mm. ready to go. And it's been read and vetted and Richard Wank was my mentor on it. It's a good script. I gave Mila Jovovich her SAG card. Her manager and agent ghost me. Hmm. I, I, I wrote the, the part for her in it and I wanted oh, okay. to, to kick off the casting with her. And I don't care if, if they don't like it because then I'll find out why. And, and, Anyway, yeah, and, and, and then my third project, as I mentioned, I want to do a TV series of children to corn in Europe. It doesn't involve U.S. rights, and it's set 100 years in the future. Yeah, well, those, those are, are the three. That's very exciting. They're ready. To, they're ready to shoot. They're, that's they're awesome. Done. We wish you the best of luck with that. That those those sound great. We, we'd see them for sure. Um, and so just because uh, I think we're, we're kind of coming to the end and, and I have to say thank you so much for your time today this this was tremendous I just I cannot thank you enough but like what do you think was because I have asked a few people that we've talked to that work for New World particularly the you know in the, the the second iteration the new New World if you will um, what do you think was the mistakes they made outside of the acquisitions that you spoke about earlier what do you think their mistakes were that they ended up sort of kind of falling apart as a company I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Not making Crimes of Passion 2. 
<laughs> I, I don't think crimes of passion should have been made. I passed on it. I, I did that as an accommodation to get tough turf and my other agenda going. Huh. Hmm. I produced the hell out of that movie, though. I mean, I, I you sure did. Thing. Yeah. I say um, that. I say that out, out of a, a, like I very much love Crimes of Passion, so um, I, I, I say that as a as a compliment. Well, I'll tell I you, I, I cleared all the rights for. I cleared all the rights for my YouTube channel, so it's going to go out soon. Right now, I'm just having a general argument about YouTube. They, they're trying to make a decision if my movies are artful or pornographic, and they're going to make a decision in two weeks. Hmm. And, and I don't want to post crimes of passion while they're thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, totally. Fair. Fair. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. I figure I'm going to wait until I'm going to wait till this is a few months water under the bridge and then post it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't even want to post vamp yet. I don't even want to post vamp yet until this is cleared up. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, mistakes that no one made. Well, I, I think one of their mistakes was bringing Bob Ramey in. I don't think he delivered anything he promised. And I think that he made some bad choices for movies and generally alienated some people um, and cost a lot of money to do. Um, and now forgive me for- I had, I think one of their biggest mistakes was ignoring my, my business plan for the company. I had a simple vision for the company. I said, I said look, we, we want to we honor our roots, deliver fan-based material the same way Sam Arkoff makes beach blanket movies and Roger Corman makes um, you know, horror movies. Um, we want to continue that tradition. I said, so what we need to do is anchor ourselves with, and I was really forethinking here, this was 1983. I said, we want to anchor ourselves with movies that are, are performed by celebrities that are not known for acting. I said, so let's you know, get a championship boxer, you know, a figure skater, people on the cover of Life and Time, and let's make movies for them and feature them, we'll be able to cast them and pay for their star salaries at a fraction of the price on their first picture. And we can become a factory for this. And I was just completely and wholesomely ignored. And now you can't even get cast in a movie if you don't have a, a social uh, channel with followers, which is what right. I was saying. Right. So they don't need to be right. actors, they need to be well known. They just have to have their own followings that will follow them to the movie. Yeah, I mean, having having actually done a movie with with Chuck Norris and paid attention, and having actually done three movies with Drew Barrymore and paid attention, mm -hmm. I came to realize that there's two completely different kinds of movie stars. One are like Dustin Hoffman, who can act, and the other are celebrities that bring so much fucking charisma, like Grace Jones or Chuck Norris or Drew Barrymore that it's up to you as a producer to figure out what to ask them to do. And if you ask them to do the right things, you have a hit. If you ask them to act, you're a fool. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, you know, for, I was gonna say, I wanted to do. that's a great That's what I wanted to plan. do in the world. I wanted to, yeah, I mean, Robbie Benson had just made a movie about figure skating. I wanted to get real figure skating. Sure. I had to just won the Olympic gold and make a figure skating movie, you know, let's, like more Chuck Norris movies. Anyway, so yeah. that's where I think they made a mistake. I, I think they, um, they lost focus on, on what they wanted to be. Like when Bob Ramey sat me down with Crimes of Passion and, and, uh, and we talked about Angel, he was advocating making the studio the Little Ladies of the Night studio. I mean, he even got that much. They never committed to it though. Hmm. Forgive me if I, I, I've, you know, it's hard to kind of find some of these things out, but I knew Bob Ramey was, you know, was running New World, but he, did he run it the entire time? Once he, he came oh, in? No, he was, he, he, he was brought in somewhere in the 83, four-ish, 84, 84, five-ish year, either 84 or 85, Bob came in and, and he lasted there until about 89 what really brought new world to an end was instead of using the lf rothschild money um to like expand television production or theatrical production and distribution and foreign sales um larry cuppin fancied himself a merger and acquisition guy and that's how they ended up buying and selling marvel and acquiring these tv stations so 
in my mind, it wasn't so much that New World came to an end, is that Ron Perlman came in with a, a laser focus of a business plan that didn't have anything to do with production or distribution. It had to do with O and O, owning and operating TV networks of which they had about 16 stations or something. It, they really did a great job buying stations. Yeah. And, and, and then what happened was uh, Perlman ha started laying off all these people. So now you've got the head of video, Paul Kohlberg, the head of foreign Bill Shields. You have all these salesmen out of a job. So Larry notices it and he's um, drinking buddies with Bob Bennett, who's just made a shitload of cash chasing ambulances in Orange County. And so Bob comes up with $10 million on the table to bifurcate the New World Library and keep all the sales team in place and, and even keep their old offices and furniture. And, and then Fox will get all the stations and the right to play the New World Library on television on their stations. And, and, and I, I think that's what did New World in. I don't think it was like um, UA and Heaven's Gate or anything where they made like bad decisions. I think that, that the Rothschild money didn't focus them on growing um, a, a, the next Lionsgate, if you will. Yeah. It focused them on, on mergers and acquisitions to let them to be a merger target for Fox networks. And in the library, for as much as it may or may not be worth ever, it was a pittance compared to the worth of the TV stations. It, yeah. it, it, the, the deal for the stations was so lucrative, you could throw away the library and it would be just fine. Hmm. Which was, they, they kind of did already because when they when they acquired the company, like Corman sort of made off with his earlier movies. Like the no, rest you don't have that right. What, what okay. happened was, what happened was, and this is how New World launched. Corman gave a right of first refusal on his entire library as part of the sale of the library. So he didn't transfer the library, but New World had the right to, if you will, on an a la carte basis, take any one title and acquire it, either under a license or an outright purchase. All they had to do to execute this was to make an offer to Roger that he could either beat or accept. And so they just, let's and say they just didn't make an offer. Yeah. And so let's say that, you know, they wanted to get some quick cash and, and I'm just making this up. And so Bill Shields puts together a five picture syndication with Dillinger and bloody mom and whatever, and starts to sell it as a five pack in Germany and Japan. And, and then he, all he has to do is go to Roger and say, um, make an offer for these rights. And then, and then he's just got to match it and then he can keep the VIG spread. And they just never, they just never bothered to really do that, I guess. No, we did that. That's how we made our, that's how we stayed in business the first few months. Was oh, selling okay. Rogers Library. Okay. So you did do some of those things for TV rights. Okay. That's interesting. Like taking the late. Foreign was sales it? was better than TV. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and Corman actually and, was and still. Here, it, I was mentioning this before. I, I, I said to you, Roger could have been a lot richer man if he hired some professional salespeople. Yeah. Well, New World had professional salespeople. We could get prices that Roger couldn't get yeah. just because of who was selling. You take two people selling the exact same thing. One guy's a novice and the other guy's an industry veteran. Well, hello, there's a difference in the price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He never wanted to pay anybody and everybody ended up leaving him because they could get better jobs other places. <laughs> you got that so right. <laughs> well at least i got one thing right <laughs> john davison told me the greatest story he said he says they're shooting ron howard's eating my dust he, they get out to location and um and 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 and, and um uh, how did he tell this story there, there was a problem with the per diems and um and, and he said roger you, you didn't give oh this was it you didn't give them any travel per diem for the day they traveled every single envelope is short the travel day per deal. What am I going to tell the crew? And Roger's answer was, I don't know, but you're going to have to think of something because they don't get paid for travel either. They probably don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. And that's it. That is it. Part three of our talk with Donald P. Borchers. Hopefully we will get to talk to him again somewhere down the road, but that is the end of our conversation with him so far. I'd also like to say, I, if you 
go ahead, Mark. Sorry. I have to, yeah, I have to say, I, I, the, he gave us so much time, told so us much time. so oh many incredible stories, the amount of insight, the work that he's done, the, the just filmography that he has been a part of. It's, it's really amazing. And, and I can't, express enough how grateful we are for like the amount of time he gave us he was truly generous with his time yeah i mean just so the listeners are probably already aware as this is part three but we had so such a long conversation with him that we split it into three episodes that is how much time he generously gave us and we are very grateful to him speaking of if you want to catch up with donald p borchers check out his youtube page he is updating it all the time now a lot of his other projects he did for New World, as well as the projects that he produced post-New World, are all there. Plus, a variety of other films. There is a ton of stuff. Also, a lot of the behind-the-scenes or interviews and stuff like that that I used for our episode on Vamp are all stuff that I found on Donald Borger's YouTube page. So, a huge resource filled with stuff. So, please check out his YouTube page. 